Benton Harbor is a small town on the west side of Michigan. It was one considered one of the five most troubled racial cities in uh, 1960, the summer of 1967. Detroit had a major riot, and there were riots across the country, but Benton Harbor stood out as one of the five most racially troubled cities uh, in America. Benton Harbor had its first riot in 1967. Uh, one black person was killed. Then after the 67 riot, more and more white people started to leave the town. And the next thing you know, it's gradually becoming a, uh, an all-white town with a few black people into an all-black town with very few white people that were left. It was the summer of 2003, and there was a guy who lived down the street. Um, they called him, uh, his name was T something, and his last name was Shern. T Shern went by, uh, his sort of a treat, street name was T-shirt. So he and a bunch of other people had these little, um, not little, but those cafe bikes, real fast motorcycles. And they would drive around town. You know, there was a lot of drug dealing on, on these bikes because they were almost impossible to catch. And Benton Harbor, by that time, it had sort of an unwritten rule that, uh, that the police were no longer going to take off in hot pursuit off after anyone because there had been several crashes and, and a lot of people were killed, uh, cops running through uh, intersections. Well, one day they were in hot pursuit of T-shirt on his motorcycle. And he's flying down what was the main drag in Benton Harbor, Empire Avenue, and he's going up. Apparently they were chasing him at like 90, 95, 100 miles an hour. Well, one of the cops apparently had bumped his motorcycle with the bumper of the car. And it sent him out of control and threw him against a building and he was impaled against the building on a piece of wood which went all the way through him. So here he is stuck on this building with the, you know, impaled on this building. It was about, uh, oh, a hundred yards away from a liquor store where a lot of people hung out. And it's in the middle of the summer and there must have been 20 or 30 people hanging out in front of that store and they witnessed that crash. That was the start of what, for me, changed Benton Harbor. Because that night, the, um, the town erupted. First, they burned the building that t -Shirin was impaled on. Then they started burning houses on the immediate block. Now, I wanted to go down and take a look at it. And my friends, you know, my black friends in the neighborhood, I said, I was getting in the car, I said, man, I'm gonna go down and check it out. I said, Bob, don't. They're, they're beating the hell out of white people down there. You're not gonna make it, you can't go. So I thought, oh man, okay. So I went in the house, and now it's becoming, it's getting dark. And this is, I'm about three blocks away from the scene where I lived. I'm looking out and I see a glow, this orange glow in the sky. And I thought, man, you know, I, I couldn't resist. I had to go see it. So I thought, okay, I've got to be black. So what I did, I got on black pants, black socks, black shoes, black gloves, a black turtleneck, a balaclava, and uh, black sunglasses. I had nothing... Um, there was no way to tell that I was white. So I'm walking over there. It was such an incredible scene. I'd never seen anything like it. All of the houses on the other side of the street were on fire. I wondered, like, where are the police? Where are the fire trucks? The fire trucks had not moved in there because they were not allowed to. Whenever the fire, fire people tried to get a little closer, they were pulled off the fire trucks and beaten. I thought there's got to be police somewhere, so I walk walk a couple blocks, and I could see police with those uh, 
those big uh, barricade kind of things that they hold, you know, when they're trying to hold a perimeter. And so they were, they had sort of created a perimeter around this. The next thing I know, I'm walking down the street and I hear these two guys behind me saying, hey, that looks like 5-0. I bet that guy's a cop. You know, he looks like a cop. And I didn't say a word. I thought, you know, the best thing is, what am I going to say? Turn around. Oh, no, I'm not a cop. So I, uh, I thought, okay, I just keep walking forward. I don't run. I don't do anything. I just keep going as if I belong there. And I was able to do that for a block and a half until then I was able to kind of bolt through, because uh, everybody was staying in the one central location. I got back to my house, and I, uh, I you know, thought, wow, you know, you know, I didn't know how far it was going to spread, how many more houses were going to be lit. I wasn't that far away. Um, but um, that was the end of that night for me. After they got the riot stopped, 570 state police special agents and cops came into Benton Harbor and they put the town on lockdown. There was a, a major curfew. Then 10 days later or so, when they lessened that, one of the state cops was shot real close to my house. That didn't help anything. And I started to see people walking up and down the street that I'd never seen before, that were taunting my dog, uh, throwing rocks. Some guys broke into my house one night. Um, I had been drinking, and uh, these guys came in. Um, somebody broadsided me. I mean, you know, kind of sucker punched me, I guess, in a way, but I got beaten over the head with a baseball bat left in a pool of blood, and they stole everything in the house. That was also the end of my eight-year run in Benton Harbor because it, the city became, for me, a little too militant and violent, and the hood was no longer a safe place for me after that.